Hello everyone, I'm Max and today we'll be talking about distal radius fractures. These fractures are very common. You'll see them quite commonly in all kinds of practice, whether it's emergency department presentations, GP consults, or of course orthopaedics. Actually one of the most common fractures forming 17.5% of all fractures in adults. Around 50% of those are intra-articular. We'll have a chat about what that means and the change in management from that. And your most common method of injury is the fall on outstretched hand or fouche. The distal radius is a very important area of the radius and a very important area of the body. It uh, articulates with the carpal bones through the scaphoid, lunate and triquetral and forms the proximal end of the wrist joint. This joint, of course, is very important for mobility of the hand and as humans, it's quite important to our work and to our life. Other importance of areas of the radius which we'll talk about include the styloid process, a small um, protuberance off the end of the distal radius and the articular surface of the bone. The distal radius is also important because of its surrounds with the ligament, ligaments of the wrist which attach to it in various places, allowing stability in producing the, uh, the movement and the range that the wrist joint enjoys and allowing us to do those fine motions of the hand, again, important for our life and work. Because of this, injuries to the wrist are very important. As I mentioned, there are extra-articular and intra-articular divisions. Oh, there we go. Uh, it's called dinner fork deformity because of this characteristic angulation. As I mentioned, this is an extra-articular fracture, not involving the articular surface. It can often be managed conservatively with um, reduction and pre- and post-reduction films to confirm an appropriate alignment. Contrast this to the Smith fracture, which is also called the reverse Collies fracture. Instead of having a, uh, sorry, I'm, I mentioned prior dorsal angulation for the Collies fracture. This is a volar angulation in the Smith fracture um, and is from rather your falling outstretched hand with the hand in extension, the wrist in extension. The wrist is in set inflection and we have that reversing of that dinner fork deformity. It's similarly extra articular. It can similarly often be managed conservatively and non-operatively. Your Intra-articular fractures include what's called the Barton fractures. These can be both um, volar and dorsally angulated and instead involve the most distal portion of the radius and are intra-articular. Often, as we'll discuss in a moment, these require operative fixation to maintain the wrist joint's integrity, stability and range of motion. Other eponymous and Intra-articular fractures include the chauffeur fracture, the styloid process I mentioned earlier. So called because of the old chauffeurs who used to crank the engine of very old cars manually, which would often backfire and force that crank back around in a revolution and strike the back of the chauffeur's wrist, causing this particular type of fracture. Other well-known fractures include the die punch fracture, the radius by itself takes around 80% of the axial load of the arm and the die punch fracture can be a result of axial load through the hand and through the wrist causing the lunate to press upon the, right, the distal radius and form a small fracture in that articular surface. This of course is also intra-articular and often needs uh, operative fixation. Other associated injuries seen with distal radius fractures are very common. Often these soft tissue injuries of that ligamentous complex that I showed earlier, the quite complex one, are seen. Most of the time that these are recognised and um, managed appropriately with immobilisation, they have good outcomes, but if not recognised or as previously talked about in drudge injuries where they are isolated from a fracture, these can cause chronic pain and issues with the wrist if not managed appropriately. Regarding fracture management, however, as I mentioned, there are two main streams, the non-operative or conservative management with 
and closed reduction and splint or cast immobilization. So the two most common uh, fractures, the Collies and the Smiths. I have put these images of the most appropriate plaster positions. The one on the left there, the Collies fracture is quite pronounced, but it shows some wrist flexion and ulnar deviation of the wrist to try and correct that um, deformity of the Collies. And of course, the Smith being the opposite is kind of a radial deviation, the extension of the wrist. As I mentioned prior, having appropriate pre and post reduction x-rays helps to confirm that your reduction was successful, that you have good alignment. Uh, and an appropriate reduction with uh, good sedate or good anesthesia on board, whether it's a, a Beers block or a hematoma block or procedural sedation or even um, general anesthetic in some cases, can often lead to an appropriate outcome for these fractures. Whether a non-operative reduction is the only management required often depends on, as I mentioned, whether it's an intra or extra articular fracture, the age of the patient, the mobility and the usage of their hand. You may be a lot more inclined to operative management in a, a young patient with an intra-articular fracture who you know, will have a long and story history of problems with that wrist if it's uh, particularly comminuted and not well reduced in a post-reduction film. But in an older patient who may not cope too well with an anaesthetic, who has a reasonable reduction, and particularly, for example, in an extra articular fracture, these can very often be managed non-operatively. Contrasting to your operative methods, there's a number um, kind of increasing in um, the kind of intervention with these, which I've divided them here. Closed reduction with percutaneous pinning or KYs being one of the quickest and um, least invasive ways of, redu of reducing a fracture operatively involves putting these guide wires, these KYs through the fracture fragments to hold them in position, which you might not otherwise be able to obtain with a just simple closed reduction and cast. The advantage of these is that you can remove the KYs shortly after the surgery. You don't need to come back in a few months, for example, if you were to put in a plate but often these, this management is less common than uh, open reduction and internal fixation, so plating of the distal radius. The advantages here is that you can often get a very good and solid um, positioning of those fragments. The downside is, of course, that you have a large piece of metal wear in the wrist joint, which can be quite compact and quite tight. For some patients, this can cause irritation and need to be taken out down the track. There are a number of complications as well which can occur with putting metalware into the body, um, which I talked about at the conclusion. The third main method for operative management is external fixation. Um, there are many different models, and this is just one that I found on the internet, but the, the gist of them is that it involves a number of rods um, passing through the fragment, similar to KYs, however larger in calibre and more um, you can often manipulate them more accurately owing to this external um, apparatus which you can place the rods in certain orientations. Uh, very good for fixation, can be removed afterwards, but of course for the patient involves open tracks into the, the bone, large metalware on the arm, um, is only really used in highly comminuted fractures, medically comorbid patients, open fractures for example where you don't want to put metalware in um, but in saying that external fixation often has very good outcomes if used appropriately. From these management uh, principles there are a few complications you should be aware of. Carpal tunnel syndrome is reasonably common even in non-operative management. For example as I mentioned prior with those with the casting of the Collies fracture or the Smith's fracture uh, overzealous angulation of the wrist can cause compression on the carpal tunnel and can, in some patients, either exacerbate if those carpal tunnel syndrome symptoms were pre-existing or even cause carpal tunnel symptoms. So something to be aware of and to monitor for uh, when you assess patients, for example, in fracture clinic. Ulnar nerve neuropathy is another uh, neuropathy that can occur, often seen, as we mentioned prior, commonly in drudge injuries, but can also be seen in the distal radius fractures. Ligamentous injury, for example, the extensor pollicis longus or flexor pollicis, um, 
injuries are also common and are one of the complications that can occur in uh, open reduction internal fixation owing to the movement of those tendons across the plate. As always with any fraction there is a risk of malunion or nonunion and appropriate pre and post reduction films or um, II imaging if you're doing an operative fixation help alleviate and make sure that you have reasonable reduction to try and reduce those risks. And of course this is a joint and it is a, a very well utilised joint in our body so any injury and particularly any um, fraction which is not appropriately reduced increases the risk of the patient having osteoarthritis in the future which for some patients can be quite debilitating and it's why I mentioned in younger patients often where there is uh, maybe not a completely satisfactory reduction with non-operative management you may lean towards operative fixation to try and maintain that um, appropriate alignment of the joint and reduce any stress areas. So that is a quick presentation on distal radius and their fractures and thank you for listening.